Okay, here we are back last week. We reached up through all the different entrancements, realizations, meditations, contemplations, up to finally realization, making it real. Healing our psychosis by becoming enlightened and making it real. And now we begin from page 156 with under the heading, Climbing Up the Heavens Through the Four Immensities. Because now we're in Samadhi. We're in the context of Samadhi. And we are in this, con in this context of Samadhi. Uh, we are... Um, going to go through the two other realms than the desire realm within which we live as human beings. And even there are gods in the desire realm. There are six heavenly states in the desire realm. And there are animal states and there are asura, there are titanic states. And, uh, and there are sort of more, there's sort of humanoid deity gods like Indra, the king of the gods, same as Odin, kind of tribal god in India, Indra, and, uh, and uh, many of them. And the Indian uh, inner science thing, because as, as I said before, the Buddhists are not atheists. They are not, they are not monotheists. They don't believe in a single creator, but they believe in gods for sure. And, uh, but they, are, they, they feel Buddha teaches gods. Buddha is not a god or a human, but can take any embodiment that helps anybody at any time. This is their belief about Buddha. And therefore they are called Deva Manushyanam Shastha, a teacher of humans and gods. And uh, in a way, if you're a materialist and you think gods are just subconscious projections, you can say that means he's the teacher of the conscious and the unconscious. You can sort of try to interpret it like that to keep intact your dogma of materialism, if you wish. <laughs> So now we're going to go into the, so there's, that's the desire realm we live in, the realm of desire, egocentric desire. Then beyond that, there's a realm of pure form, where there is a subtler kind of ego, but it's not gendered. So they say there are no women, but they're wrong. They, there's no gender differentiation. So all the gods of the realm of pure form, which is called pure because there's no gender, are both male and female. So they're at a higher level of blissfulness because their male side and female side are very complementary within their own body. Actually, any god or human or titan or animal, anybody in the human realm has both male and female components in the body. But the bodies are differentiated variation-wise into male and female to reproduce. But in those four realm heavens, they don't need that because they're reborn just by sort of apparition, it is said, this Pum, they just suddenly embodied. Because the power of mind, the relationship between mind and body is different, and the power of mind, which is sort of like pure energy without atoms, is more powerful. It's not that those gods have no atoms, but their mind is more powerful. So what we could do is, and we can imagine something, they, when they can be what they imagine, put it that way. And they imagine themselves as divine beings that are androgynous, actually in the realm of pure form. And it is said there are 16 levels of that realm, or sometimes 17, but they mostly usually 16, because, you know, it's just a scale of pure form, of these ungendered beings. And, um, and then beyond that, there is, in the sense of beyond getting more and more concentrated, uh, the beings do, the upper ones, because they still have a subtle kind of egotism, and so they have a subtle kind of craving, <clears throat> and they're not even quite satisfied to be such high gods in sort of a kind of self satisfied bliss, and yet still feeling separate from lower beings below them, and so therefore still not quite fully satisfied, not completely blissed out like a Buddha blissed out. So then they want to get more concentrated, they want to escape into a separation. And then they go into an infinite space state. They go into what's called the third realm, the formless realm, or the, or the immaterial realm, where they feel there's no matter because the energy has become, there is energy actually, 
which in a way is kind of matter, but it's so subtle that they don't perceive the, the mental the minds of the beings don't perceive any, themselves as having bodies. And so their isolation is quite complete because actually bodies are what enable us to bump into other beings and make us, bodies are already teaching us that we're not separate because they, they bang into the walls and the floors and you know, they, they, they remind us of our relationality. But the mind can withdraw so powerfully from that into psychosis that we can go into a state of infinite space, of infinite consciousness and space. The idea of space, race extensa, is too coarse, so just pure consciousness. And then that gets boring because expanding infinitely in pure consciousness. And then nothingness is better, it's like more peaceful. And then there's somehow both pure consciousness and pure nothingness seems to be meet upable into neither conscious, neither awake nor asleep, neither alive nor dead, neither conscious nor unconscious. There's four most subtle states, which are traps actually for the ego, because there's still a stigial ego that the person is totally unaware of, because it's just, it doesn't resonate by in a sense of separateness of the body from other things. The state of isolations are so extreme. And Buddha taught these states, but he taught that. And it was powerful to achieve them because in a way, that's the ultimate cure. If you're prepared and you're under the control of the protocol of relativity, that's the ultimate cure for any hankering for separateness, any less craving, any less addiction to your psychosis of being separate from everything, or those four states. So in a way, for example, when Buddha attained in the Pali version of his leaving his body, he went through these eight, what are called these eight contemplative states, these eight realizational states, four in the form realm, sort of cycling up through the 16 layers of the form realm, which I'll explain, and then cycling through the four formless states, to the state of neither conscious nor unconscious, seemingly embracing dichotomy to some extent, but still with the super subtle self-separation sense activated. And then when he reached that state, Ananda, his close attendant disciple, but who was not yet a saint, a nirvanic, had not yet attained nirvana himself by having to fuss around as Buddha's attendant, says to Mahakashyapa, who was Buddha's successor as leader of the mendicant community, he turns to Kashyapa and says, oh, now Buddha's gone from the body. And Mahakashyapa says, no, he isn't. But wait a minute, I don't sense him at all. Well, it's because he's too subtle to be sensed, but he's not gone, you just wait. And then they say the Buddha, this is in the Pali again, another powerful hint that nirvana is not a separate condition. It's not one of the, it's not a formless separate state. So then it is said the Buddha's mind comes back down through these eight trances, these eight concentrations, these eight meditations, whatever you want to call them, eight states, and bound from the neither conscious nor unconscious into nothingness, seeming nothingness, from seeming nothingness into infinite space, from infinite space, in, I mean infinite consciousness, from infinite consciousness into infinite space, from infinite space into the infinite, uh, immeasurable, immense equanimity, not quite infinite, but immense equanimity, from immense equanimity into immense joy, from immense joy into immense compassion, from immense compassion into immense love back at the boundary between the realm of matter and the, and the pure, ma uh, pure matter and the desire matter, desire realm and the, and, the and the pure matter realm, pure form realm, to that boundary. So then as Ananda felt his presence again in the, in the pure love level, and then he went back up again through the immense love, immense compassion, immense joy, and immense equanimity, at the event horizon of the disembodied formless state or bodiless state or immaterial state. And at that event horizon, he left his body. 
And Mahakashipa said to Ananda, now he's gone. And guess what? The Buddhist heavens, the Buddha heavens, what are called the Buddha verses, the Buddha lands, are in that event horizon. That's where they are, right there with the highest of the form realm, gods known as Brahma in Buddha's time. Brahma, Shikin, the highest Brahma. They're all Brahmas in the realm of pure form or pure matter, but the highest one is called Brahma Shikin, the head Brahma. Okay, so that was an enormous hint there, you know. So, Four immeasurable, so now we're going to begin to do, so I, I summarize them, now I'm going to go through them in, as written here. The four immeasurables or four immense contemplations, love, compassion, joy, and equanimity occur when lucid wakefulness brings you into full awareness of the imperfections of the desire realm, so that you, whether you're male or female in it, or anything in between, or bi, or whatever, or androgynous, so that you renounce the, the highest heavens of the desire realm are more or less androgynous, where it's said you just live in fantasies, and anything you fantasize becomes like blissfully real to you, passionately real. You don't need a partner, in other words. And the higher one than that is where you simply or voyeuristically enjoy the fantasies of others. So again, you're not sort of seeking partner. And that then leads into the ungendered state of the realm of pure matter or form naturally, in the top of the desire realm. So lucid brings a full awareness of the imperfections of the desire realm so that you renounce the conscious levels of delusion, lust, and hate. You feel so much better in your own skin, hence automatically sympathetic or even empathetic about the condition of others who seem so obviously agitated from within by these impulses they cannot control and must blindly obey. So they, in a way, this has took me some 30 years maybe 40 years <clears throat> of even being a monk for a while and then trying to be a decent lay person and so on, of, and study, study, study all the time. But for 40 years to realize that renunciate, what we think of as renunciation, becoming a mendicant, or even becoming a somewhat renunciate, renounced, detached, you know, able to give things up, able to do letting go of things as a lay person, that that which we think of as depriving yourself, in the Western and modern way, we think of you give up something. If you let go of it, you're being deprived. You know, So we have our ungenerous version of life. But when you cultivate that generosity and so forth, that actually you feel better. You feel more free. You're not clutching on to things and experiences in the same way. And that makes you feel more less anxious and more open internally. So you tend to feel more happy within yourself. And you, forget you have a level of spaciousness in yourself where you're not driven by your impulses in the same way because you're going to let go of them. You can let go of your insistence on being right all the time. You can let go on your insistence on having what you want and having your way all the time. You can let go of having, wanting to get rid of whoever's bothering you right away all the time. And you can begin to be much more happy and interconnected. So renunciation, therefore, contrary to our notion of monasticism in the West, the mendicant in the Asian society is considered happier and luckier because they don't have the worries and anxieties of the householder having to possess this and feed the family and earn the living and fight in the war and pay the taxes and so forth. They're free. They get free lunch, free brunch. And all they need to do, all they can do is study externally and internally, and they become scientists and they become, they become yogis and yoginis. And that's considered a huge privilege. They're like a lifelong MacArthur people. Bucky Fuller said, everybody should have a lifelong research grant. And a, few, a lot of people will just waste their time, but those, those who are free to really explore reality will invent so many great things it will easily repay for the cost of feeding them. <laughs> but Buddha already did that. And starting in the 5th century before the Common Era, before there was such a thing anywhere as monasticism, he created a mendicant order who were able to live free of the household concern and therefore be somewhat free from the authority of the king and the fear 
instilled of the gods and, and levied upon you by the high priests. He was able to do that because of the wealth and generosity of Indian culture. Only in India. Not allowed in China, not allowed in Persia, not allowed in Europe. But throughout Eurasia. As long as wakefulness is less than fully stable, you grasp at the slightest emergence of the pleasance, wanting it still more, and therefore instantly cutting it off and turning it into an experience of the suffering of change. When it becomes more stable, you are able to let it go on, ungrasped, let it flow through you, and so approach the zone of stable happiness known as the love immensity. That's when you are able to leave the gender desire realm, when you have the love immensity, when you love just infinitely everyone equally and so forth. The set of the four immense states of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity corresponds to what is referred to as the heavenly realm of desireless form or matter. This realm of subtle, relatively boundaryless embodiment is known to be inhabited by celestial purely bodied, bodied that is to say Brahma Kaika, Brahma bodied, deities, Pure, since complete in both male and female gender elements, hence free of desire for the opposite sex. Natural celibates. Such pure divine states, however, are not an end goal for you as a bodhisattva seeking Buddhahood, though they are important for you to discover and access as part of your discovery of your own inner landscape. Outer cosmos reflects inner landscape. These immensities are also called the four contemplations, dhyana. The factors enabling these contemplations are attentive consideration, careful analysis, physical fluency, that sort of flow state, the zone state, mental bliss, and one-pointed concentration, which are the antidotes, respectively, of the five hindrances, depression, crippling doubt, irritability, agitation, and lust. As you ascend from the full focus of lucid waking mindfulness to the level of feeling the release of inner freedom, you mobilize one-pointedness to launch through the four immensities. And you sort of, and in doing so, you mentally, in your mental body, and remember it has seven limbs, limbs of concentration, faith, and discernment, bliss, etc. You know, we listed them before. And those are anga, those are new limbs, you know. They become like a new body, your meditative body. You kind of are able to leave. You know, when you're sitting cross-legged and sitting like that, it's because you leave feeling in your body. And you start feeling in a body of pure love and pure concentration and pure this, pure that, you know. And then in doing that, you become aware of the plane of existence of the first three levels of the Brahma bodied div divinities. Maybe you might think of them as angels in the West or something. And, you, and the, these are just the first three, they are just completely overflowing with love. So you, these are like a super heaven, they're beyond the heaven of the desire realm, which are super pleasure heavens. And these are heaven where pleasure is the heaven and you are the pleasure. You're like a whale in an, in an ocean of pleasure compared to how you feel just inside your normal desire realm skin as a human, or even as a desire realm deity. And you're just a field of pleasure, actually. And this, and, and this pleasure just encompasses everyone else, so it's immense. And you just love everyone and everything. And they say when you achieve, the yogi or yogini in ancient India who achieved those in that immeasurable love, and this is, Hinduism too, Patanjali has these things, in the Yoga Sutra and so forth, it's not just in the Buddhist one. All the Indian inner sciences can achieve this. And you feel that when you're in this state, a cobra or a tiger approaching you will just feel flooded with love themselves and they will lose their hunger and they won't eat you or they won't bite you. They will see you like, they will feel like they're being beloved by their mother or something, you know, they will feel this wave of love so powerful, like you're a divinity or something, like you're an angel. So you're immune to any danger when you, as a meditative yogi in the jungle, they say. And then, then what happens is you expand so much that you feel 
the love to the other. And the love to the other means you want them to be happy and you become empathic about it in that immensity. And so then what happens is it begins to attract your attention that they don't necessarily feel that happy. So then you, you get brought into their feeling empathically and you can't bear them not feeling happy because your love is so strong, the wish for their happiness. And so you want to take away their unhappiness. So your, your love becomes so immense that it becomes compassion as well and it wants to replace their suffering. And then you, this takes you up to the next three levels of those sort of energy body like great giant whales or dolphins of bliss of those Brahma body deities. So you like those field bodied beings. So you become combined, you add the intensity of compassion to the intensity of immense love. You have immense compassion. And then with your immense compassion, you actually might freak out because you are expanding and expanding and you're feeling more and more beings and there more and more of them are not feeling that happy. Actually, you're aware through your immense compassion. But then you realize that actually the life force that animates them at the very core of their souls, at their heart, at their super subtle level, and they're in their mitochondria, inside their cells and molecules, at a subtle level that they kind of are unaware of, that, that life force itself is happiness. It is bliss. It is love. And when you find that, you realize that even though they're feeling miserable, their core life force that gives them the energy to feel miserable is joy and love. And so you feel a kind of immensity of joy with them. And you resonate at their deeper level. And your compassion knows that they're not quite feeling that. But you can, you can sort of let that be and you can sort of resonate right to the soul of them and find the joy in them even Maybe at first when you reach there, you're not yet Buddha, you can't find that level of life force joy, even of beings in hell, which is what a Buddha can, but you can't probably, right off. But basically, like more ordinary beings that your immensity is encompassing, you're getting there. And you're feeling that let the life force of any being, even if it's in agony, it's living in agony. So the living force is the bliss of the interconnectedness of their self, which they are configuring in a way where they're very dissatisfied and very miserable and in agony, frustrated. That brings you up to the sixth through ninth level, seventh through ninth levels of that. And then through the 10th through the 16th or 17th levels, you have the highest level where they are really expanded to feeling that about everybody with equanimity. In other words, they're not only focusing that people like them, the ones they love, the ones they identify with. They add to the immense love, immense joy, immense, com immense compassion, immense joy. They add immense equanimity, that is to say. They have a feeling of equality with all beings. And those gods of the top seven levels are almost like Buddhas in that they do feel in their, because they're, they are in that immense, those immensities of equanimity, including the love, compassion, and joy immensities. And so they're almost like a Buddha where they almost feel they are these other beings, but at least they don't quite, the difference between them and a Buddha is they don't quite feel they really are the other beings. So that doesn't stir them to leave their heaven and go out among them in their hells and everywhere. They still stay in their realm of pure form. Okay? That's the difference. So, I did the five hindrances, yes. To the level of feeling the release of inner freedom, you mobilize one pointedness to launch through the four immensities. In the first of these four contemplations, that of love, your inner contentment overflows with the feeling of love that surges toward beings because you feel better and you can't understand why they don't and you want them to feel better. Who you sense are trapped in frustration and stress, automatically wanting them to feel as happy as you do. You consider other beings' stress compared with your relief 
which in turn raises your energy. You analyze how they could be just as happy if they were more realistic. You develop a sense of fluency in your body and mental bliss arises, making agitation unnecessary. These factors prevail your, propel your one-point concentration into the first zone of immensity, that of immense love that overflows from your own heart toward all other sensitive beings. Through this, though this state is pure love, its articulation in thought is, may all sentient beings have happiness and the cause of such happiness. Wouldn't it be nice if I could offer that? I must do so. The flow state is immense and you tend to dwell in it timelessly and it is appropriately called a divine abode, a Brahma abode. When you fully realize it, you become aware that there are numerous divine beings kind of like angels who inhabit the same heavenly planes, not as meditating human like yourself, but as an actual energy embodiments in that immensity. While you admire their being, their loving condition, you restrain yourself from joining them. I mean, some yogis and yoginis might not. You might then become reborn in that kind of heaven. You just leave that human body that you're sitting meditating and one point at least unaware of being in that human body and then just wants to jump into being that kind of porpoise body. So you restrain yourself, that, that energy porpoise or whale body, you restrain yourself from joining them and getting stuck in that state as you feel the state's remoteness from the many levels of being and you seek the Buddhahood that interconnects with all of them. After some time, because the relativity that, that your constant correction of your psychosis that prevents you from absolutely welcoming yourself into that state. After some time, as you were previously oriented with motivation to actually bring about your willed happiness, your consideration and analysis functions fulfill themselves by revealing that the beings themselves that you're loving are not very happy already. They are suffering. Realizing that your heart gushing immense love moves you naturally into the second of the four immensities, the immensity of compassion. Compassion here is the empathetic will to relieve the beings from their suffering and embrace their pains and agonies with the immensity of your flowing loving happiness. Your flow state thus expands even further, leaving behind consideration and analysis and abides even more fluently and blissfully in the immensity of compassion articulated in the thought, may all beings be free of suffering and have the causes of freedom from suffering. Wouldn't it be nice if I could offer that to them? I must do so. After a timeless time in the divine abode of the compassion immensity, the next three levels, levels four through six, your sense of constriction within embodiment diminishes naturally, your physical fluency becomes fulfilled in the immensity of bliss, bliss that overwhelms the perception of constrictedness of beings and resonates with their own inner pleasantness, their own deeper reality of freedom from suffering. At this point you ascend and expand into the third of the four, the bliss of the joy immensity, the factors of consideration, analysis, and fluency all fulfilled in the divine abode of intense joy articulated in thought as may all beings have the reality joy, their own life force, their deepest life force, their subtlest life force that is free of any suffering and the cause of such joy. Wouldn't it be nice if I could offer that to them? I really must do so. Finally, the bliss function becomes fulfilled and you ascend and expand into the fourth immensity, equanimity, wherein you feel a timeless identification with the nirvanic reality of all beings. In this state of equanimity, you are close to transcending any sense of separateness of self and others and reach the plane of the divine abode of immense equanimity where your love, compassion, and joy, your love, compassion, and joy, your love, compassion, and joy expand into the fourth immensity, the equanimity immensity, 
wherein you feel a timeless identification with the neuronic reality of all beings, in this state of equanimity or close to transcending any sense of separateness of self and others, and reach the plane of the divine abode of immense equanimity, where your love, compassion, and joy are completely shared equally with all sensitive life, where your expanded mind is at the plane of the high gods, the Brahma gods, and this fourth immensity is articulated as the thought, may all beings have the equanimity free of attachment to the dear and the hostility to the strange, and the causes of such equanimity filled with love, compassion, and joy. Wouldn't it be nice if I could offer that to them, and I must do so. If we use our imagination to consider what it feels like to attain such contemplative divine abodes, we can realize how tempting it must be for a yogi or yogini who reaches there to think that she or he has reached divinity, the highest possible state of a being, liberation, divinity, and experiential oneness with all living beings and things. In fact, a yogi or yogini who is unprepared will definitely consider these abodes as far preferable to ordinary desire realm, humanoid or divine planes, or even desire realm, pleasure heavens, and will be quite likely to choose rebirth in the court of great Brahma, or even seek his throne. Alternatively, it is reported that there are four further, more subtle states of disembodiment for the more sensitive and therefore ascetically inclined, the immaterial states, or rather mediums, as they go beyond relative spatiality of a state of infinite space, infinite consciousness, seeming nothing whatsoever, and beyond being either conscious or unconscious. These states may be even more seductive to the one who is totally bent on having their own peace and quiet, seemingly permanently without any disturbance. As for the divine beings who embody this sense of immensity of the divine form realms, it is said there are 16 or 17 heavenly planes that are the abodes of numerous pure-bodied deities who have landed there out of attachment to those heavens. Beings in these realms have subtle, semi-boundaryless bodies and use only their senses, sight, hearing, and touch, as they live on pure energy and have no need of taste and smell. I think of them as gigantic energy whales who lack hard boundaries and sexual differentiation of any kind and just surge around feeling love, compassion, and joy as they merge in and out of each other. When they reach the seven last levels of equanimity, they verge on infinity where embodiment seems to vanish in a release free of any sense of loss. The yogis and yoginis who visit these realms in lucid wakefulness, and the deities who have been reborn in these relatively lust-free, pure-form realms are androgynous, self-aware, non-coarse physical bodies of bliss nurtured by pure energy immersion, and the gradations relate to various degrees of subtlety until, at the top level, the bodies are as close to pure light as can be and still be a body. While these are wonderful states to be in, they are not the pure bliss of nirvana, which is a kind of bliss that simultaneously and inconceivably interfuses with all other life forms, even the most dense and alienated by misknowing, which are namely beings in the hells. So that has gone through the eight states. I just want to add that when you're in that Brahma state, at the, within the top seven realms of this number 16, or even 17, but 16. Actually, 17 is where the Buddha pure lands are. So you, you're actually 16, only in 16 where the Brahma deities are. And they say in the Flower Ornament Sutra's su discourse, sub-discourse called the Ten Bodhisattva Stage Discourse, Dashabhumika Sutra, that bodhisattvas who reach that tenth stage, and here this is esoteric, so it's not like, it doesn't sort of, it's exoteric rather, so they're not saying that that bodhisattva wants to become, enter the mandala of the Buddha land, because they're not talking about that in that exoteric sutra. 
So they say that that kind of tenth-stage bodhisattva who lives in the state of pure love and knowledge but is still not quite a Buddha, so there's still the subtlest sense of separateness from infinity. Of still be, they're very close, but they're still, and they're great creative, and tremendous creativity and mindfulness and artistry of shaping worlds, and even like Brahma, the Brahma God, the high God, within the realm of pure matter, pure form, beyond gender, and so on in pure bliss of a certain level. They like to take rebirth as a Brahma God. So they, if there is a Brahma in a particular universe where they reach that as a yogi or yogini, they go to another one where they don't have yogis and yoginis, and they become the Brahma of that world. And they become, they act as such an all-powerful deity who can be mistaken by humanoids as a creator or even by other gods as if they were omnipotent creator. But they're not, and they're not, they know they're not omnipotent, but they can be mistaken as that. And they don't mind that in a way, although they tell people they have to take care of themselves and they help those who help themselves. That's sort of hint they give. But they can also do a lot for shaping worlds and helping beings and develop educational settings and support Buddhas. They know about Buddhas and they're waiting to be one, kind of. And while waiting, they like to be such gods. So we shouldn't over overdo the difference between the Brahma state and the Buddha state. And the only difference is this super subtle thing. And it only has to do with the reason of relativity. The, the Bodhisattva in 10th stage still thinks they are trapped in a concept of being still tiny psychotic concept of being separate from the reality. So they don't think they really are all the suffering beings, including their inner bliss of their life force and their mistaken suffering, which is what makes the difference with the Buddha becoming a Buddha, where they realize that the beings themselves are not enjoying their own life force to the full. And because they totally understand their state of misknowing. They empathize 100% with it. That's the difference. Which makes it inconceivable. That the most blissed out being can be fully empathetic of all infinite beings in hellish conditions without being discouraged about it, without being dragged into it, and yet in a way be fully empathetic with it to the degree that they can fully help those beings caught there to escape from there. Coach them how to do it because you, they, they, they are trapping themselves there. So have to like reach into their being to get them to realize the, the non-necessity of staying isolated in such a hellish condition. So in a way, or to be able to do that, in a way, the yogi or yogini has to go further with the one-pointedness, with the samadhi. And they have to experience giving up being a god into the formless state of pure infinite space, into the formless state where spatiality is too crude. And they go more subtly into infinite awareness, awakeness. And then when that becomes too crude and they go into kind of infinite sleep of nothingness, of unconsciousness, they go into black hole. They let go into black hole. And then even in the center of black hole, they find the white hole and they simultaneously embrace the black and the white. But they're still simultaneously embracing a black and a white. And they haven't found that both black and white are equally transparent maybe. And so they still, the, the state of just that is still separate from all of other being state. And the real reason of relativity helps them do so. Their inference of that reason becomes a direct experience for them. And then they choose to descend. 
Their life force takes them back toward embodiment because that's the way they can reach toward other beings. So they come back down from beyond consciousness and unconsciousness. They dip their toe into their mental toe into, into nothingness. They dip their toe into infinite consciousness. They dip their toe into infinite space. They come out of the white black hole into the Brahma bodied infinite equanimity. And they touch then and thereupon into Buddha birth land. And maybe they realize then the difference between pure Brahmahood, Godhood, and Buddhahood. And then they just to show off to their disciples, they may go back down to pure love through joy, compassion, and immense love, and then come back up and manifest Buddha lands all over the place, transparency realms on the head of Brahma, of the Brahman. Who knows how they do it? I can't, it's all unimaginable. <laughs> it's imaginable, but, but when you still think you're separate from what you imagine, you can't fully experience it. So, and under the next heading, I will continue a little more. And, well, that's so far out, that stuff, though. So I'm probing around in there. Loosening the self and relaxing into immensity. Imagine you have stilled your mind and focused your consciousness on your own reality as modeled by materialist scientists. Focusing on how you are composed of molecules, atoms, subatomic particles, waves and super subtle wave particle, objectively indeterminate quantum foam energy phenomena. You focus within to such a degree of subtlety that you experience yourself dissolving into this super subtle world, yet you remain conscious of yourself as it's flowing, super subtle, fragmented, and fragmenting processes. It seems inconceivable, of course, as our habitual consciousness seems to conform to our concepts of hard boundaries, self and things. But this is what the yogic progression up through the four immensities seems to consist of. It is truly what may underlie the meaning of the word sublimation in that the energies of instinctual lust and conscious desire are restrained and rechanneled back into oneself, and instead of melting outward into another in sexual release, one melts into a stable reality into one's own place as mediated by the normally unconscious autonomic and automatic central nervous system. A key point here is that the immensities are not experienced as another place into which the yogi or yogini enters by crossing its boundaries. They experience as the uttermost inner essential being of where the yogi or yogini is present, the actual presence of the yogi or yogini. The mind, having felt related to ever more subtle sublimated levels of embodiment, moves into a sense of disembodiment, which at each level is perceived to have always been its own essence as well as that of all other beings. The immensity of equanimity brings you to the event horizon of departing completely from any sense of embodiment whatsoever, where your one-pointed concentration turns into a formless trance state of complete dissolution of any sense of mass. Your self-experience as the infinite mass of pure light, your infinity of presence rendering your sense of differentiable mass irrelevant. Every differentiated material thing, subjective and objective, seems to disappear into the medium of the experience of infinite space, which is experienced as a still deeper, seemingly more releasing bliss, but in a, in a way beyond bliss as release from stress, as the awareness floats free from any sense of restriction or limitation, such as any kind of embodiment. Because you're in the formless realm there, and the way infinite space is where you give up on space. And what follows then is only time. So in space-time, you have gone beyond the spatial sense when you become infinite. You and everything else in your experience become infinite. 
You wrote that super subtlety thing. As the mind naturally expands into the infinity of this infinite space, it seems as if the insubstantial mind itself becomes infinite, and one sublimates or subtilizes and releases yet more deeply and intensely into the realm of infinite consciousness. An infinite consciousness happens because having come in there as if you were a point of consciousness and you suddenly feel infinite and you still have kind of a residual feeling of wanting to expand because you're used to space-time as having space as well as time. But you also simultaneously, your mind is so solid, it realizes the futility of expansion because it never will reach infinity. But you have a little worry about your point because you're still used to being something that's different from what's around you. The tiniest fragment of your psychosis is still there. So you want to be conscious of everything that's there and you want your consciousness to embrace the whole thing and so you feel your consciousness itself is the whole thing. So there can be no surprises. It's all your consciousness. And then that becomes a little coarse because it's somewhat stressful because there's still the residual sense of expanding in time and yet knowing it's impossible and being still nervous you're going to bump into something unpleasant even though you don't have any embodiment but you're used to having had that and so therefore you, you embrace nothingness and you just go to sleep below unconscious it's too much for you you seek rest in that unconsciousness but then even though you're there in that unconscious, you still have a residual awareness and you still have some faint memory of the light and of the space and of all the other previous things and of the ta temporality of the situation. And so then you get to where you're both conscious and unconscious at the same time, you're asleep and awake, dead and alive at the same time, sort of, but yet you're experiencing that as an isolated state not as simultaneously with being any kind of embodiment, only in this disembodied, isolated state. And the negation of embodiment is only somehow very deeply buried in your unconscious awareness, but, but you... But if, when you find it there, though, because of being bound in the royal reason of relativity and willingly, lovingly insisting upon that. You then turn through your love and you come back down through it all. It's really amazing. The four immensities and the four bodiless trances are themselves called the eight planes of sublimational contemplative achievement or the eight trances. And the yogini or yogi who achieves these experiences for real is considered a master contemplative. Buddha himself is depicted as ranging up and down or in and out of these eight states during the various versions of his demonstration of corporeal death. His final departure from the body in all accounts in the great total nirvana discourse Mahaparinirvana Sutras in either Sanskrit or Pali occurs when he's at the event horizon between immense embodiment and disembodiment between the fourth divine abode contemplation and the first formless trance giving the hint that his Buddha continuum has both physical and mental dimensions even after leaving his previous Buddha emanation body. The most important point here, one that may differentiate the Buddhist contemplative phenomenology from those of most other mystical traditions, is the point that Buddha made to all his followers. No one of these eight trance states and experiences is a state or experience of nirvana. Not even the most super subtle seeming, non-dual seeming medium of neither conscious nor unconscious trance is nirvana. It is not liberation. It is isolation. It is not the final release from suffering that is Buddhahood. A Buddha is definitely a master of all eight states, but not a terminal dweller in any one of them as none of them is the ultimate reality of all things from which a Buddha is by definition never apart. 
Rather, a Buddha is defined as someone who is present in all these states and in all other desire realm states simultaneously, active everywhere out of compassion for other beings, still feeling caught in the trap of suffering. Buddha allowed his individual vehicle students to imagine that nirvana was just such a state beyond the great phys gross physical reality of the desire realm and beyond even the more subtle pure form realm divine abodes, beyond even the formless media and maybe something like a state of seeming total obliteration of presence, a kind of ninth state beyond the fourth formless medium. He put them into the paradoxical situation of not equating nirvana with any kind of formless state, yet allowed them to think of it as something other than the relative world that they perceived as pure suffering. He taught the samsara nirvana duality as the provisional situation for these disciples. Though as we saw in the great focus of mindfulness discourse, he is constantly hinting at the non-duality that is this real solution. In my opinion, that was because their fixated ego sense was so strong, though so incredibly subtle, but so strong and so rigidly imagined as their real self apart from relational things that they could only envision release as a glorified projection of their desperate desire to withdraw permanently and escape into this imagined absolute disconnected self. Once they had done their best at that, he knew they would feel more secure and then intended to appeal to their subtle and refined intelligence to recognize that the seemingly separate absolute could not be absolute since they had related to it by entering it experientially. This then brought them back into contact. Therefore, it has a boundary between this separate absolute, has a boundary between it and the relative. So therefore, it could not be absolute, since they had related to it by entering it experientially in space and time. This then brought them back into contact with the more challenging quest of maintaining the natural bliss of release, while maintaining infinitely interconnected with everything, which is defined as the fully awakened condition of nirvana. Okay, so we've gone through those eight states, and we still have a way to go. We're on page 164. We still have ways to go. Two more sessions, I would say, at least. Because this is really juicy here at the end. But we went into these high states. And Western mystics also have reached this. This is, this is the science of the mind. It's not Eastern or Western or Buddhist or Christian or Taoist or non-Buddhist or atheist or any such thing. This is reality. And the exploration of reality by Buddhist astronauts and their stars and their outer space and inner space are interconnected. So we can also call them psychonauts, navigators of the psyche, of the subtle plane. And so in the Western mystics like Meister Eckhart, the different Sufis, the Christ of Avila, John of the Cross, all the, many people, they always say when you go into God and you go through the desert of his heart and then if you really, uh, and then the Sufi says if you really kind of meet Allah and you're destroyed, that means you let go through these formless states. <laughs> and your ordinary little personality is destroyed. And yet you are back. And then how they understand and interpret that is because they don't have the collegiality of the inner science developed in the Western say, civilization, or in China for that matter, because the authorities, you become intolerable to the authorities because you're such an open-hearted being. Your field is so divine. If in case you, you might be a protected saint in some institution where they keep you away from the kings and the power brokers, 
But if you're not protected like that, you will then be considered insubordinate, like Al Halaj, who was crucified with machetes, with scimitars, on the wall of the Sultan of Baghdad's palace for saying he was God. You know? In other words, he, became, he dissolved into God, you know, into what he thought, because he was thought of God as absolute. Some pure force, pure light beyond everything. You know? So they achieved these states, but it's the interpretation and understanding as scientific analysis of the phenomenology of these things that they have yet to learn from the great Eastern mind scientists. So, okay, so now we dedicate the merit of this exploration of the eight trance states and the really meaning of meditation and the real, and basically what we're trying to get here in this part, the reason I go in detail in this part, and if you read it again and again, and if you try to practice it again and again, armed with the security of the royal reason of relativity, the reasonability of nature and life. And you, because you realize that although it's beyond linear reason, it's also beyond linear irrationality. So that's another duality you have to go beyond. And reason helps you do it. So you have to keep it up till the very end. And so you must respect your own mind. And you must realize you have the capacity for realization as well as entrancement and as well as meditation and as well as contemplation and as well as analytic vipassana and one-pointed shamatha. You have all of these capacities. And when your mind, when you cultivate this kind of realistic samadhi and develop that power of that, you naturally come up with clairvoyance, telepathy, all kinds of things that would be considered supernatural by materialists, but are only really supernormal by spiritual materialists or materialist spiritualists, or whatever you want to call the more advanced thing where inner and outer science have merged in their methodologies, in their explorations, in their mutual, re mutual reconfirmation. Which is where, which is the birth of the new age, the birth of Shambhala, the birth of, the birth of the saved planet, and the happy planet that His Holiness promises us, the Dalai Lama promises us we can have. So what we reach to at this point is trying to cultivate in this realistic samadhi a deeper respect for the highly focused mind, and inspiring you to be a yogi. You know, the yogi thing of sitting cross-legged, hands folded in the lap, back straight, shoulders back, head slightly down, eyes closed and so forth, breathing through the nostrils, tongue on the palate, mouth, lips closed gently, etc. All of these things have to do with creating a state where you leave the body, actually, and you go into the body made of the limbs of the noble one, the limbs of compassion, the limbs of bliss, the limbs of analysis, the limbs of confidence, the limbs of trust, the limbs of all of these things. And then you understand what divinity is, actually. And you can go past it and back and through it and not be enticed into it, actually. And you can feel the deeper levels of, of bliss, not as only requiring the mechanics of the body, and you empowering your mind enormously, not being also trapped in some state created by your mind and yet lost in them because of its straight power. And remember, you're healing yourself of your psychosis. And that means you're finding the suffering of even the divine realms and even of the formless realms, the desire realm, divine realms, of the, the, the pure matter, the pure gendered form realms and the formless realms. And you can traverse all of them entrancedly without being trapped in any of them. 
your mind remaining fresh and open for the inconceivable. So we dedicate the merit of this to becoming like that completely, to becoming Buddhas ourselves as fast as possible, all wise and all loving, in order to help other beings in all walks of life become Buddhas as fast as possible and just exactly equal to us. So we dedicate the merit.